Hey, Bills Mafia, we know there's only one topic every day, all Bills, all the time. And now Matt Bove and Sal Capaccio are going really deep, talking Bills all year long, because it's always game day in Buffalo. All right, a quick turnaround for the Bills to play Thursday night against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They play Sunday. They lose the New England Patriots. One of the best you know, things about the quick turnaround is kind of flushing it, getting out of your out of your mind, thinking about it. But at the same time, this team has some issues that we need to discuss here, and it's always game day in Buffalo. Welcome in, Sal Capaccio, Matt Bove. Quick turnaround, Matt, is um, always kind of tough on everyone. But I guess, um, you know, again, in this situation, getting rid of that and turning the page quicker, as people said in the locker room, is a little bit easier when you can have something to focus on so quickly. If you win, it's easy to say that if you win, but if you lose, then it's two losses in four days, and then you are really concerned about everything, especially with that extra little rest there. It's a huge, huge game for the Bills. You have to win. You're still in the easy, quote, easy part of your schedule. You cannot fall to four and four looking at the Cincinnati Bengals down the road. It's about to get harder. This is a really big one for the Bills, and yeah, in theory, it's great to have it four days later, but that's only true if you win. So now you have to win. Well, the talk really since Sunday has been about the offensive performance and the defensive performance. Ken Dorsey, a lot of talk mm-hmm. still about him, what they're doing personnel-wise, and that's going to change as well. Let's kind of start with the injury report that Sean McDermott gave us on Monday. Now, the team does submit an official injury report for Monday when they play on a Thursday because of the timeline with the league, mm-hmm. but more notable than the actual injury report through a walkthrough is what we know about Dawson Knox. He is going to have surgery. He is going to miss time. That's a blow to the Bills' offense. Look, I understand he has not had the best year. I think the wrist has been a part of that. We all know that they drafted Dalton Kincaid, but this is a a, a significant player that they like to use, and Dawson Knox now is going to be out sometime. We don't exactly know exactly when or how long, I should say. McDermott didn't commit to that, but I couldn't get the sense, Matt, when he talked, if he was saying he wouldn't say he would even characterize him week to week. Is he saying this because it could be shorter, or is that because he's saying it could be something even way long term? I don't know. To me, it didn't seem like it was going to be something super long, but that's obviously just kind of my read on the situation because it could be something minor. I mean, if it was something that he was playing through, maybe it's something minor. The thing that's so interesting to me is, does this change the philosophy of the Buffalo Bills moving forward? And if so, is Dalton Kincaid ready to be their top tight end? if they start to use more 11 personnel packages, which is, I think, what they're going to do. Because right now, Quint Morris is still on the injury report, too. So I don't think you're rolling a lot of 12 personnel. Wait, Maybe it's him and David Edwards as your extra guy. But right, right now, I think you're going to be a base offense with 11 personnel, and I think that means we're going to see a lot more Dalton Kincaid. There's two layers to this. In a way... I think it could make them more dynamic because mm-hmm. I like Dalton Kincaid's skill set and I think that he should be utilized way more. It would not shock me if he becomes the second most targeted player on this team behind Stefan Diggs. It also might make them a little bit more predictable, but that's not necessarily a bad thing either. And when I say that, it's if Dalton Kincaid's on the field, you're probably not running the ball. You're going to start to have to, but who cares? I've always been of the belief establishing the run is nonsense. Like, use your fastball, use Josh Allen. Sure, you want to be effective when you run, but guess what? The last couple of years, when the Bills' offense has been better than it is now, they really weren't able to establish the run. Right now, they're a pretty decent running team, but the offense isn't great. There feels like there's some symmetry there. So this is an interesting situation for the Bills because I really like Dawson Knox, the person, I think as a player, he's a a good, nice piece to have. But up to this point, he just hasn't lived up to expectations. Maybe that's because of the wrist injury. Maybe it's a culmination of a lot of things. But he he made multiple plays in the last few weeks that you would like to have back. And now without him there, Kincaid gets those opportunities. They also have Reggie Gilliam if they want to use him as a tight end. He's mm-hmm. a fullback, but he can play that hybrid role, uh, fullback, H-back, tight end. The other option is Joel Wilson from the practice squad, who's been with the club since you know the offseason, but he would be the next guy in line to kind of be elevated to the active roster. So we'll see if they go out, they sign somebody, or what they do with that. You mentioned David Edwards. That's exactly right. I mean, that's what they, that's what they did Sunday night without Dalton Kincaid. David Edwards lined up as the extra offensive lineman slash tight end 
um, eight different times, I think it was, reporting eligible. So they want to go with that traditional blocking extra tight end. It would be David Edwards in that role. And then there's Von Miller, who only played six snaps, did not play at all in the second half. And from all the talk last couple of weeks, it seemed like he was trending the other way. Something had to happen. He had to tweak something. He is on the injury report with a vest, vet rest slash knee. Sean mm -hmm. McDermott said they have to manage him better. And I don't know, Matt. I don't know exactly what's going on there. If, did, did something happen during the game? There's some video that's been circulated about it was a play where he dove. He got up and looked like maybe he was limping, but he stayed on the field that play. But then he didn't play at all in the second half. So kind of wonder, you know, where that is and what's happening. But I will say – but also McDermott did not give any indication of anything that seems serious enough that he would be in danger of missing a game. Yeah, it's a weird thing because when you see that he has the six snaps and he only plays in the first half, you immediately think, okay, he had a setback. I wonder how bad the setback is. But Sean kind of poured water in that on Monday when we talked to him. But that just doesn't make sense to me. And he said that, like, okay, this is just the way it played out and we'll see what happens moving forward. How does it play out this way? Why is he even active if he's only going to play six snaps? It feels like you could get that, you could get something more effective from somebody else in making them active. So I don't know if this is going to become a trend. I just don't know how in this next game, with 10 days rest after it, you're going to go from six snaps to like 30 snaps. It feels like you're going to probably take a step back up to somewhere in the middle of where he was in his first two games, which is like 20 and 27 or something like that. So do you have Von Miller active to play 15 snaps? I think at that point it makes sense because you, he's a difference maker and he can make an impact. But if he's only going to play 10 snaps or less, then just let him get the rest for this week and for the next 10 days because he's really not making an impact on the field yet. I think at some point he will, but he's not doing it. And part of that is because of the workload that he's been given. He's he's mentioned several times, Von himself, that you know, he has to wear the knee brace until after Thanksgiving. He has to wear it for a whole year. He obviously was hurt last year on Thanksgiving. And I wonder if like that's something <coughs> – I'm sorry, but I wonder if that's something that he is actively thinking about and what is playing is happening here. Maybe – that's something that he's kind of going through and wants to kind of get rid of that because he's mentioned it a couple of times. The other thing is McDermott even mentioned it could be, you know, a little bit matchup, things like that. The, the Patriots did a good job of getting the ball out of Mac Jones hands and not having him move around the pocket. Maybe that was, Hey, you know, what are we doing? Vaughn? He's, you know, in that situation, we'd rather have more of an interior rush. They move Greg Rousseau inside. So a lot of things could be happening there and why. So we'll monitor what happens with Von Miller. Speaking of interior Ed Oliver missed the game. It was a huge loss for the bills, obviously on Sunday. He still has the toe injury. He was limited in Monday's walkthrough, so it looks like he's trending in the right direction, I'd say, like that. Yeah, it feels like that was a decision to ensure that he was ready for this upcoming game against the Bucs. And then, obviously, you've got the extra rest against the Bengals coming up. So they need Ed Oliver. Excuse me. We're both like yeah. sitting here coughing this morning. They need Ed Oliver. Obviously, Daquan Jones has been a massive loss for them, and you realize how big of a loss it is when you also don't have Ed Oliver because their interior pass rush was – basically non-existent against the Patriots and they did a fairly good job stopping the run, but they could not create any pressure up the middle. No, the, the, the middle of the field has been a source of concern ever since they lost both Daquan Jones and Matt Milano. I thought losing Matt Milano last week was a really, really big deal against the New England Patriots, especially maybe on that final drive, that final play. Maybe he's a guy that can make that play, but either way, you know, 29 points to a Mac Jones led Patriots offense. Obviously the bills right now are scrambling to try and figure out how they can mitigate some of these losses uh, real quick, just kind of wrap up the injury report because we're talking to you here on a Tuesday morning bills play Thursday, uh, which so we're, you know, two days away and they did have a walkthrough on Monday. They had to put the injury uh, report out. Bill inspector. He actually did come back and play. He played 14 special team snaps. I looked it up because he injured his hamstring again. Sean McDermott said, people said, what do you mean? He injured a hamstring. He wasn't even on the team. Yes. He played 14 special team snaps. He was activated off um, IR a couple of weeks ago. But that said, other people on the injury report, all full participants, um, including Terrell Bernard, Spencer Brown, Kyer Elam, Jordan Phillips. So it looks like they're they're healthy in that regard. Um, but Bale Inspector, the other guy notable. All right, let's get to the um, comments from Sean McDermott. So, look, I'm just going to say it this way, and then you can kind of react and tell me what you think about you know what I say here. Because I think that I, I've kind of been digesting the fan reaction, the media reaction, ever since Monday afternoon leading into Tuesday when we're talking here about Sean McDermott saying that he is, you know, it, to his level of involvement, he said, of course, you know, he is involved. He's the head coach. 
and he wants to have meetings and involved and to make sure that things are where they want he wants them and you know under his philosophy whatever the you know I, i'm paraphrasing a little bit there seems to be some outcry and pushback and people upset about this i i i i'm more surprised that people don't understand this is normal like this is how it works mm -hmm. he is the head coach of the football team Every single head coach molds the team in their own philosophy. They hire people that have their own philosophies. They are involved in every meeting. They are the they are the people that set how the team dresses at practice, how they conduct their practices and walkthroughs. They are in all the meetings that discuss what the travel schedule is. This yeah. is what the head coach is. That's what the role of the head coach. I think in this situation, it's different for people, and they don't like it because he's a defensive-minded head coach. Look, yeah. tell, tell me an offensive-minded head coach. Do you really think Andy Reid – is not involved in the defensive game planning of the Kansas City Chiefs. This is not abnormal. I don't know why people are so upset simply because, let's be honest, they're just upset at Sean McDermott, and this is another way that them to be more upset about him. They're also upset because of what they perceive his philosophy to be, and we don't know for sure what that is, but we can also kind of put the pieces together because this goes back to when Brian Dable was here, and it always felt like there were these clashing ideologies of what the Bills were supposed to be. And Sean is very much a fundamentalist of, like, you play good defense, you establish the line of scrimmage, and you make sure that you have a running game. Where Brian Dable was, well, we have this freakazoid quarterback and this unbelievable wide receiver, and... Remember, for a while, the Bills ran out of a base 10 person, not a base, but they used 10 personnel a lot. They didn't even have a running back on the field. It was just like, all right, everybody go, and we're just going to go have fun out there. So, excuse me, they didn't have a tight end on the field. So, it's interesting because I think when people hear that comment from Sean and from Ken Dorsey, they think, oh my goodness gracious, Sean McDermott is the reason why they are trying to establish a run game, and it's why there's been such an emphasis on this, and this is a big problem because this is clearly not what the Bills need to be. I think there's a little bit of truth to both of the things that are saying here. I think what I'm saying is you don't love to hear that from either side because of the optics, but it's also not a surprise. Like I feel like that's one of those things that's probably better left unsaid. Even though we all should know that Sean McDermott is involved in the offense. I don't necessarily know if it's something that needs to be come out and said publicly. It's just one of those. Well, things he's that asked a question. Avoid. How involved are you? And what, what, what is he going to say? Hey, listen, he could say, is he going to tell everybody I'm not involved at all? I mean, he did say, no, by the just, way, I believe in, I believe in letting my coaches do their job. And I think sure. that part has gone away from people like understanding he's not, he's not calling the plays on offense. No, he may, I think the question is, Matt, the question we don't know, because neither of us are in these meetings or whatever, mm -hmm. is he specifically directing Ken Dorsey today, you must run this much 12 personnel, you must run this much 11, you must mm -hmm. get the ball to this guy. I can't believe that's necessarily happening, because I also want to point out, they are third in the NFL in scoring. They are averaging the mm -hmm. same amount of points right now through seven games than they did last year for the entire season. Yeah, but the the standard needs to be different because this defense is injured and banged up and is not going to be able to hold opponents to what you were able to hold opponents to in years past, because you just simply do not have the talent there. And that's just kind of the way it's played out for the last couple of years. So to say that they're the same as they were last year, that's not good enough. Even though they were 13 right. and three that ultimately didn't get them anywhere past the divisional round and the offense needs to be better. So what you did last year needs to be even better. And right now it's not even close, even though the numbers say that it's close. It's clearly, I mean, they've got 10 combined points in their last three first halves of football that they played. Okay. And wait, 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 wait. The first half counts. Of course it does. They scored 25 against the New England Patriots. This is not on the offense for this week. We went through on the post game show. I went back and looked. they punted one time. They had mm -hmm. 25 points. They played Mac Jones. Why are we upset about the offense in that situation? Well, because it's not good enough. It absolutely should have been. That's the problem. So wait, it's if the defense gives up 32 and the offense doesn't score 33, we're blaming the offense? No, but I think given you're look like when you look at it in a three week span here, it's the same conversation as week one, where it's not the defense's fault that they lost the game, but it's also Zach Wilson. And you should yep. have been able to probably stop him. And you didn't. And I understand that the offense was more at fault there. I do not think that the defense gets none of this blame, but there is something to be said about you scored 25 points on offense. You only had three in the first half. 
Seven of those points came because you got a turnover like at the 20-yard line, and then you were able to score a couple plays later. You've got a they're playing like prevent defense on the second last drive where you get the touchdown. Th- these are not excuses. The offense is not good enough. The offense is a shell of itself. I think this is a backwards way of looking at it. They moved the ball. They punted one time. They scored 25 points. 21 points is the mean in the NFL. You were playing a horrible offense. Mm-hmm. The defense is the reason they lost the game more than the offense after looking back at it to me. They yeah. offense, you could say not good enough because they didn't score enough points. At what point do we say that's good enough and you should stop somebody? 30. They got to score 30 oh, points. I, mean, I, ever- think, I think that is – I look, it, that's fine. I think they have the capabilities, Matt. I think that is way too unrealistic to expect any team to do. You just don't average 30 points in the league. One team in this league right now is averaging 30 points, the Miami Dolphins. I'm not saying that you got to score it every week. I'm saying, but like, you got to get close to it. And right now, they're not even doing. I mean, two weeks ago, they scored 14 points. And all I know two weeks ago is a quarter. different story. I agree with you. But what what is the what is the baseline this week? You're playing Baker Mayfield. I mean, you should conceivably be able to go score 21 points and win the game. But that's not good enough. And everybody, because I do not trust their defense at all. And this is going to be a fault of Sean McDermott if this continues, because to his credit, his defenses have been very good. And a lot of times they have made plays. But guess what? You don't have Daquan Jones. You don't have Matt Milano. And you don't have Tredavious White. So guess what? There's going to be teams that score 30 points on you. Mac Jones just did. And then you can flip the conversation the other way. Is it not good enough? Because Mac Jones was able to score 29 points on you. So if they're able to score 29 points, don't you think the offense should probably be able to also score that against the Patriots? No, I think you should still hold them to less than that. Sure. But, I mean, it's you, one you, of those conversations. You, 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 you can also look. They're they're injured. It's going to be harder. You you still have to be able to do a better job than that. My issue is with the offense. Defensively, I understand the defense is not playing great right now. This last week was a bad game. They've got all the injuries. I think that's like a legitimate excuse because of all the injuries. But this is the conversation we had three weeks ago when they started to have all the injuries. You have to win games because of your offense. This defense is not winning you games anymore. So if the offense is not playing even close to its potential, what what is the ceiling for this team? The ceiling for this team is maybe getting to the playoffs. It's not trying to win a championship. And if your offense does not figure it out soon, then it's not even a foregone conclusion that you make it to the playoffs, which is really, really scary to think about. What is the offensive ceiling? Let's talk about that here. It's always game day in Buffalo. All right, so, I mean, what what we're expecting from the offense, we've seen them do in the past. Um, what is realistic to expect week in and week out um, on a consistent basis? Of course, matchups matter here, no doubt, and playing some better defenses, some, you know, worse defenses. Right now, they're averaging 28 points a game. That's including a couple blowouts early in the year. They scored 25, which is not a bad number in the NFL. I want to point out again, not a bad mm-hmm. number to score 25 points in an NFL game, by the way. Um, what is the ceiling for this team? Are, do they – you say – do they have the capabilities of being that type of team to consistently get too close to over 30 points? If they decide that they want to, and I know that that sounds ridiculous, but right now their offense is a shell of itself because they, for some reason, well, I know the reason Josh Allen is not running the ball. And I don't think that's because Josh doesn't want to run the ball. It's because I think they're scared of him running the ball Mm -hmm. and potentially hurting himself, not just now, but also shortening his career because they've seen what hap- what has happened to other quarterbacks who have that play style, and they have to try and figure out the balance of, is this when we need to start being smart so we can extend his career a year or two, or do we realize that we're in the window and we need to say, go do whatever it takes to win football games? The answer is probably somewhere in the middle, but I also think that they're trying to turn Josh Allen into something that he's not. And I think that the first game of the season set a tone for them that has been a little bit difficult to overcome because he made so many mistakes in that first game that they were like, okay, we're just going to let you go out there, make the plays when you can. We're not going to turn the ball over. We're going to be smart with the football and we're going to win games by playing complimentary football, which is now bogus because you're not going to win games playing complimentary football. You just got to win games by putting up a bunch of points. Sure. Your defense might be able to have some big games here or there, but I'm not counting on them every single week. So that means you got to win by your offense. And right now it does not feel like they're capable of doing that consistently. Like, like they need a big game against the bucks. They need to be able to go out there and put up 28 points. And it's funny because I say that 
it's three more points than they scored and they had a missed field goal against the Patriots. So I realized that, right. But that's part of it too. Like what's going on with Tyler Bass. Cause I'm pretty sure he's missed had, his last three kicks, right? Three out of four. He, he three out of four. He missed, so he missed last three. Out of four. No, no. I, I think that you said it right. Like while they need to score 28 points, that's good. That's what they should have had last week. They had 25. He missed a field goal. But to me, see that that's where I go to the bar. It was okay. Like that's the bar you got there against a bad offense. Now, 100% agree with you, though, that everything that's happening with the offense, mm -hmm. it really kind of boils down to what Josh Allen's able to do here, not able to do. And by the way, he was not that good on Sunday. He just wasn't. No, he misfired no. on some passes. But every week I say to myself, I'm on the sidelines and I'm watching Matt and I go, this is a spot where I think they really need to have this, you know, Josh design run. A Josh, you know, follow everybody around the edge, get the two yards. This is a spot. And I watch another play and go, why didn't Josh run on that play? At some point, I don't know. Don't know when it is. I hope it's going to happen. I'm not sure it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. At some point, they're going to have to let that come out again. And Josh Allen, I understand the risk that's involved with it. I get it. Mm -hmm. I know why they don't want to do it. We've heard it many times over the last year, or even plus last few years. We heard it at the owners' meetings. We heard it at the combine. We heard it every time Sean mm -hmm. McDermott, and Brandon Bean speak. Brandon Bean, what his famous, you know, or notable thing he said was. You know, there's a difference week two versus week whatever. You don't want to run over a linebacker in week two. Like, at some point, this has to change because I think, Matt, what has happened here is, to your point, which is right, they've reined him in to say, we can win by not having him do that enough mm -hmm. games where when we need him to do that, we'll be in a good spot. And they haven't won. So at some point, they have to pivot now and say, now we got to start letting it happen. Yeah, but when does that change? I don't know. My question is that something like in the playoffs you unlock it? Is it in a must win game? Because well, it's, that's all it's that's, critical time now. That's what I mean. It's right now. It's like you got to win right now. And this is not, there's going to be people who are listening to this. And I understand the frustration who say the injuries to Josh Allen have not happened running the football, they've happened in the pocket. Correct. It's not about, I think, the short term. I think it's about the long term and protecting himself and his career from ending kind of abruptly like you saw with a player. I mean, they're not perfect comparisons, obviously, like Cam Newton, like Andrew Luck, like guys like that. So I don't think that it's about necessarily the short term. I think it's about the entire career. But right now you're four and three. You have as many losses this year as you did all of last season. The playoffs are not a foregone conclusion. You're in the seventh spot right now, but – there's a lot of teams in the AFC that are right there. So you need to unleash him at some point. And it's funny because it really doesn't matter. But in 2021, when we were having these same conversations about the offense, they figured it out in the second half of the game against the Bucs in Tampa, and they still lost. But that was the first time that offense started to look really dynamic. And then they went on a run after that and did not lose again until 13 seconds. And I think the game before the box game was the wind Monday night football game against the Patriots. So it'd be very interesting if it was Patriots box. And now once again, it's Patriots box and maybe they have a chance to figure things out. You hope the outcome is not the same, obviously, and they don't lose the game to the box. But if they win this game for as bleak as things look, they are five and three. You've got a little bit of extra time mm -hmm. and you're going to Cincinnati in a game that you'll probably be the underdog in, but it'll be close. Maybe you won't even be the underdog because they've struggled at times this year too. Mm -hmm. So who really knows, but a time to get a little bit more healthy. So yeah, things don't look great right now, but the narrative could flip with a good game all around and obviously a win. Yeah. Unfortunately, I thought the same thing. It was the same thing on Sunday. They they'd want Sunday. They'd be in first place right now in the AFC East because the dolphins, uh -huh. Lose your dolphins, Matthew Bove. Lose my dolphins. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me also bring that perspective again. I want to make this clear. This is not like some sort of excuse making for the Bills. I, all it is is a perspective. Okay. I want people to always keep in the line and in mind the perspective of the league. The mm -hmm. Miami Dolphins scored ten offensive points against the Philadelphia Eagles. Ten. The San yeah. Francisco 49ers, two weeks in a row now, have scored seventeen points. The world's mm -hmm. greatest team. Oh my God, this team. I was reading things about them going 17 and 0 two weeks ago. They've lost yeah. to the Browns and the Vikings and scored a total of 17 points in both games. It is not easy to get to 28. It is not easy to get to 30. It is not easy to win every single week in the NFL. I just want people to get a little bit more perspective here on how the league works. The issue for me 
and this is specifically about the offense, is that it is now not like a one-off or even a two-off. 100% it's right. three weeks in a row. Yes. And that's a trend. Because if we said, you know, we did the podcast after the game in London, and it's like, yeah, there's a lot of factors here. The travel is a factor. The injuries are a factor. Yeah. They just didn't have a good day. And then you follow it up against a Giants defense that isn't very good, and you don't even score in the first three quarters of the game. You still get 14 points, but like, come on and then you lose this game to the Patriots even though you scored 25 I know the numbers say that 25 is okay and you should probably be able to win I actually think the Bills beat the Patriots last year in New England with do you know the score that was it less than 25 actually they might have won oh, I think so yeah year. because uh, the <clears throat> Patriots had like mm, might have been like 24 10 the score of that game yeah, or something yeah. like that but regardless it's just a sliding scale 25 mm-hmm. is not what 25 was when you had a fully healthy defense 25 is now you're giving yourself a chance to win, but you're not ensuring that you win. And that's why I think the bar needs to be higher for the offense. And I think they need to seriously step it up because I don't trust this defense to hold opponents to 20 points to 14 points to some of the things that they were able to do when they were healthy. And it's also your opponents are about to get much tougher. So you need to figure this out now so you can hang around with those opponents because this defense is not going out there and holding the Chiefs to 20 points, holding the Bengals to 20 points, holding the Cowboys, holding the Chargers. I just don't see that happening. So you're going to have to win games where I don't want to necessarily say they're shootouts. You're going to have to score points. So that's why it's like these are the weeks when you're supposed to be able to get into that groove, and they haven't, and it's been three weeks in a row now. Difference between 25 against the Patriots and 25 against the Chiefs, too, no doubt, right? I mean, like, yeah, that's it's part of my frustration of the talking point since Sunday is I think 25 against New England should be enough. You didn't do it. it. it 25 be. against the Chiefs, tell me all about how you got to get to 32. And that's and that's not, but it's not enough. And then part of that is on Sean. Why was your defense able to give up 29 points right. to a team that, <laughs> excuse me, hadn't scored more than 20 all year? They man- they the the Patriots entered the red zone I think six times all year before this game. They were in the red zone five times against the Bills. Yeah. All right. So and yeah, w- there was a couple short fields as well. By the way, one of those was special teams, and they had a big punt return. Matt, the special teams haven't been good on this Buffalo Bills team either. Kyler Bass no. has missed three or four field goals. They allowed a they had a punt kind of partially blocked a couple of weeks ago uh, against uh, Jacksonville, um, and then they allowed they allowed another big punt return on Sunday. These are areas where this team has to be better because you're not helping your offense or your defense. No, and then the penalties too. <clears throat> yeah. You know what I mean? Not the no calls that did not happen. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about penalties where you're shooting yourself in the foot. Like if you're going to play this sloppy brand of football that's inconsistent, you cannot add that layer on top of it. Because if you do, that's almost way too big of a hill to overcome. All right. Well, they do play the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which present their own challenges, especially in a short week. You never know what's going to happen. Baby South Camacho. Asleep. Oh, babe. oh, okay. Here we go. Sorry, I was, just tell- I was just telling you. Sorry for the. No, it's okay. Gonna- we can even keep this part in. We, we're not going to edit it. We're going to say Matt was going to bring the baby on the show. The baby yeah. Was I was going to bring the baby on the show. I was going to set her right next to me for the oh. last segment, and now she fell back asleep. So well, that's I'm not gonna- that- good for you. Good for her. Yep, but I think that maybe on the next show we should have baby appearance. Ne- how about a win? So next time they win, <laughs> we'll bring the baby on the show. There you go. Next time we win, never wake <laughs> a sleeping baby, right? So I'm not going to be the guy that does that. That's right. Okay. Um, Bucks are are an interesting team. They're going through a transition at quarterback. They had a big, you know, competition. It's Baker Mayfield. You know, we're talking about what the Bills' bar should be, what the Bills should be able to do. I'm looking at their defense right now. They're actually top ten generally, right around there, um, stopping the run. There are opportunities to throw on this team. They've given up 246 yards passing a game, 6.7 yards per play. Uh, those aren't great numbers. I think the Bills have an opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, they aren't really getting to the quarterback all that much. I spoke with uh, my buddy TJ Reeves, who's the sideline reporter for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who said, really, though, the defense has pretty much held up. They're very good in the red zone. They don't allow you a lot of points. Huh. Move the ball a little bit, but it's really their offense that has struggled more uh, here. So, this is an interesting game for the Buffalo Bills. A, if they can get touchdowns because the Bucks defense has been good once they buckle down. And B, obviously to turn that defense back around to say, hey, 
look, I get it. Like you're dealing with all these injuries, but you can't let this offense get off the mat. Baker Mayfield is one of those quarterbacks that if you can get him to not hit his first read, you're able to make him make mistakes. So that's what you're going to need to do. He's got two really good weapons, obviously, and Mike Evans and with Chris Godwin. Chris Godwin and Baker Mayfield were both on the injury report for their Monday walkthrough that they did, but it doesn't seem like that's going to be anything that's going to impact this game, so we shall see on that. And then after that, Chase Edmonds coming off the injured reserve. So you might probably see him a little bit mixed in because the running backs that they've had, like I think White only averaged, let me look it up, he had 2.6 yards of carry against the Falcons the other day. So it's not like you're getting a ton out of that. So I don't know if their running backs pose a huge threat, but obviously Mike Evans and Chris Godwin do. So those are primary concern one and two. And then offensively for the Bills, it's like what you were just saying. They don't give up a ton of points. The Bills, when they get into scoring positions, need to convert not missed field goals, not settling for field goals when you're close to the red zone. Like you just have to score points because I do think even though they only scored 13 against the Falcons last week, I don't know. I think you need to be able to probably like, what's the number? I always like to ask this question to you. What's the number you would feel confident in? The bills are going to get the win if they score this many points. I'd say like 20, 27. See, again, I, I mean, I guess I'd be confident, I think, in that. But you, know, you got to hold them to – like this offense averages 17 points a game. I mean, they just played a, a Patriots team that just stinks average on offense. Tw- and they, average 12 a game. <laughs> I know, right? But that's my point. Like, I mean, I don't know how high you can just accept. I guess part of the issue is here, there's one thing to say, and I don't disagree, Matt. Like, you can't expect – like, this defense, they're up against it. But what 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 are we allowed to accept and say? Oh yeah, well they're not going to be as good, but it's okay. They're going to give up twenty six a game. Like that's too much to me. Still, no, that's even way with too the much. injuries, way too much. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's that. on Sean. That's on Sean. You got to figure out what you're going to do. They did it a couple weeks ago. I mean, they only gave up nine points. It yeah. was to Tyrod Taylor and the Giants. But what's funny is that offense might be more is probably more dynamic than the Patriots is, and they scored twenty nine. <laughs> So it's a, it's a weird. Those league. were great in the red zone that night. You know, over five is what the Giants were. And they'd have to be great yeah. in the red zone here again. So the Buccaneers averaged 17 on both sides of the ball. So the good news is their offense is only averaging 17. They can't run the ball. As you just pointed out, they're averaging less than four yards a carry. Mm-hmm. The bad news is teams are only scoring 17 points against them. So the Bills offense here needs to get it in gear, as you point out. Uh, this is one of those games. Just go score points. You, you can. And this is the other thing, too. Because I think when they start slow, they get in their own heads yeah. and then they try mm-hmm. and be a little bit too perfect. Just r- just come out of the gate ripping it. And I don't know if they will. They probably won't. But throw it on first down, throw it on second down, throw it on third down. I don't care if you get a target digs every single play. Just do what you got to do to move the ball. I, I, it was a conversation a couple weeks ago. Are they targeting digs too much? What the heck are we talking about? He <laughs> is the, so good and so far their best weapon. It's not even close. There's no such thing as targeting him too much. When they need I, a play, he usually makes it. I'm going to give you a stat here. Just looking this up because of the, uh, the, the heavy, the more usage I think we're expecting um, from Dalton Kincaid. So targets on the year, catch percentage, Dalton Kincaid has been targeted 27 times. He has yeah. 25 catches, which That's is, be- listen, it is second in the entire NFL amongst qualifying guys who've been targeted with enough targets. As far as his catch percentage, number one is actually the running back on the other side of the field this week, Rashad White. That's it. Rashad White, number one, Dalton Kincaid, <laughs> number two, as far as catch percentage in the league. Like I would like this to be a, you know, we took the Dalton Kincaid game. Like, I want to see this happen. I want, I'm, I'm excited to see him get more integrated into this offense. So, yes, I agree with you. Keep targeting Stephon Diggs. He's number two behind only Puku Nakua as far as targets in the league, and that should continue uh-huh. to happen. But I think Dalton Kincaid needs to be the number two targeted guy on this team right now. There is a little bit of an element to that, though, that his depth of target is, like, non-existent. Dalton Kincaid's routes are all super close to the line of scrimmage, and I want to see that change. I, I want to see more of a Sam Laporta-type deal than I want to see of how they use Dalton Kincaid. So, honestly, that number, if it changes, might be a good thing. Like, maybe mm-hmm. he doesn't catch as many of the targets as he has up to this point, but when he does, they're that much more dynamic. I'm not saying, okay, all of a sudden just send him down the field every single play because he does have the skill set where it, it is something interesting that on fourth and two at the end of the game when they needed to get a first down, they threw it to Dalton Kincaid. 
and he was able to get the first down. So I think they have trust in him, and I think they know he can succeed in those short yardage situations. But let's also see him used in the intermediate passing game and maybe even stretching the field a little bit just to keep defenses on their toes and keep them honest a little bit. I wonder, I'm looking at the, the Chase Edmonds thing. Are they expecting him to play? They activated him I, to I, the... That does. I, I don't know. I'm just saying they took him off short, IR. That's, it is, yeah. No, no, it's a, it's a good point because, I mean, they need something to help out that run game a little bit. Uh, by the way, for anybody or Syracuse listener, Sean Tucker, uh, running back on the um, on the Buccaneers as well. And you know, I know he had a great, you know, outstanding career at Syracuse. He'll be coming to town, but he hasn't really given him the ball. He doesn't play that much. Uh, but I do wonder if Chase Edmonds will play uh, and just a short turnaround. It's um, they got to travel up here on Wednesday. It's going to be interesting. Maybe that's a guy though that they want to infuse. He's got some speed, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. That would be something for the Bills to deal with. Um, the Bills have to be able to stop the run and force the Buccaneers to become more one-dimensional. And then you can do what you said, like you know, against Baker Mayfield, and you know, get after him a little bit. I think that would be more of the key here to be able to do. Do not let the Buccaneers get off the mat, as I said earlier. Running the ball, especially, they cannot run the ball right now. Yeah, and I also think there's something to be said about this game being at home. You you need yeah. this game to be at home. You need this game to be a win, and you got to make sure that you jump out of the gate early, and you got to make sure that the Bucks cannot get comfortable moving the ball early. I think that sets the tone a lot. The Patriots were able to score points and move the ball early, and I think that led to them getting some extra confidence and kind of just having some success throughout the game. And the Bills, obviously, you know, it also lets you kind of play the game that you want to dictate, right? Like the Patriots, once they got the lead, were able to throw a ton of short passes and a ton of intermediate passes and just wait for the Bills to make a mistake. And they did with their missed tackles. And it ultimately ended up costing them for the Bucks, even though they can't really run the ball. I don't know if that's a team that you want to be playing catch up on because they do still have some really nice wide receivers. You should be able to stop them like you said, 17 points a game. But with the Bills' corners that they have, I don't love those matchups for Christian Benford and Dane Jackson. That's a mismatch for the Bills. So you really need your line to get after it, and you really need a big game from Ed Oliver if he's going to play because it was very clear, even though Leonard Floyd and Greg Rousseau and A.J. Epinesa have all been really good this year, it was very clear against the Patriots how much they need an interior pass rush to ultimately go out there and really be able to change a game and to be effective. Because without that, that line was a shell of itself against the Patriots, against Mac Jones. Matt, your network is carrying the game Thursday. Tell everybody about it. Yeah, so if you don't have Amazon, you do not have to worry. The game will be on Channel 7 locally. So I'm sorry to my Rochester friends, to my Mm. Syracuse friends, to people who are listening out of town. That is only in the Buffalo TV market. So the way it works, that is if you're in Buffalo, the games that are aired on national networks have to also go on a local network so that everybody is able to watch the game. But that is only a rule in Buffalo. I do not know why that's not a rule in Rochester or Syracuse in the secondary markets. That's just the way it is. So if you live in Buffalo... Great. The game's on channel seven. Coverage starts at seven o'clock. I'm sorry if like you've heard me like coughing. Or, are you is everybody sick right now? Does it feel like I am so uh, sick. I'm not sick right now? I lost my voice last week. The only reason I coughed a little earlier, I was, I'm drinking some coffee, so it might be down the wrong pipe. But, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not. Thank goodness. I'm gonna knock on wood here. I'm not sick right now. My wife was, actually got a little bit sicker a little like last oh week. Oh my gosh. For the last couple of days, I feel like somebody's just like hit me with a yeah. sledgehammer. Maybe it was the bill, maybe it was watching the bills. Maybe that's what ultimately <laughs> put me over the edge. By the way, real quick uh, on the network thing, people ask all the time, well, how do I know if it's, if I get, if it's going to be in my house? Well, the simplest way to know is, do you get Matt Bove on your TV? If you do, you're mm-hmm. going to get the game. If you don't, yeah. you're not. I mean, do you get WKBW wherever you live? That's really the way, the best way to put it, I guess. Yeah, if you live in the Buffalo TV market and your local news stations are WKBW, WIVB, and WGRZ, GRC. then you are in the Buffalo market. If right. you get WROC, WHAM, and WHEC, then you are in Rochester. So that would be how you know. It's pretty much, basically, it's like Batavia is the dividing line. Amazon, obviously, for the streaming platform. And WGR Sports Radio 550, the Buffalo Bills Radio Network. I'll be on there with Eric Wood and, of course, Chris Brown calling the play-by-play. All right, thank you very much to Mike Robbie for producing and uh, helping us out here on a very quick turnaround for us, too, on the Always Game Day in Buffalo podcast. You can always listen wherever you uh, can, wherever you pod, I should say, iTunes, Spotify, and watch on the Sal Sports YouTube page. All right. Can you well, hear this? Can you hear this? She's up. 
She's awake. She needs me now. I love it. So Perfect timing. Good time. All right. All right, baby. All right. Go go be with the baby. Go do the dad thing. We'll talk to you next time. It's always game day in Buffalo, everybody. 